Good morning, church. It's a delight to be back here and uh, watch the baptisms. Isn't that amazing uh, to see people young re- represent the fact that they belong to Jesus? Uh, now, as a traveling missionary and a professor, I really miss my stint that I did as a pastor and church planter, baptizing people, you know, putting them in the water, dead, through burial with Jesus. There were some members I didn't want to bring up, I want to say that. (laughs) But uh, generally speaking, it was wonderful uh, to bring them up to a newness uh, of life. Uh, I'm also thankful uh, for Pastor Jim Sup and uh, the camaraderie we have, particularly with Tony in missions. Uh, This message this morning uh, is not specifically on missions that I usually come to share, but it's a message that's been on my heart the last, I would say, almost a month since uh, what you would call post-pandemic, uh, traveling a little to see uh, how our Christian workers and leaders are doing in restricted access countries. Uh, coming back from Pakistan, before that in India, then before that in Jakarta, in uh, um, Indonesia, uh, on Thursday, I'll be going uh, to, where am I going, Thailand, Ubong, and then from there across the Mekong into Laos. Uh, I work in access restricted countries and do church planting among those who are suffering for the gospel. And uh, this message comes, and I was actually uh, driving when Jim called me and said, listen, you can speak on whatever you want, uh, I'll be away. Uh, so he said, uh, share something from your heart. So this morning... I would exegete the scriptures and share, but I just want to say to you that how much I appreciate uh, being a teaching partner and a friend, a missionary consultant here at Reston Bible. Your work of love, your labor of love uh, is, is widespread. In fact, when preparing this message, uh, do I need to share this with Reston? After all, uh, they are everything and more. But I believe there's something for us uh, to, to listen and learn from this morning. I, I'm also glad that uh, uh, my flight got back. Uh, you know, you reschedule and you never know uh, the, the flights uh, these days. And when people say, how did your flight go? I, I would often nowadays say uneventful. In other words, I just got here. I'm so glad because anything and everything, can, it reminds me, I'm going to speak today on encouragement and Barnabases, and it reminds me of this uh, stewardess uh, on the flight that came and said to the people on the flight, she said, uh, I've got some bad news for you and also some good news. And they were like, what? She said, which one do you want first? Well, they said, well, what's the bad news? Well, said, the bad news is both our engines have failed and this plane is going to crash. They were like, oh, what's the good news then? Well, she smiled and said, we're going to crash land on water. So there's this thing, and then with a smile, she came to the middle of the island. She said, listen, in this transatlantic flight, those of you who want to go back to London in Europe, you can swim to my right. <laughs> then she said, for those of you who want to go back to North America, to, to New York, she said, you can swim to my left. <laughs> then she smiled and said in the middle, she said, for those of you who do not know swimming, thank you for flying United. <laughs> You know, sometimes you, you get these messages, you wonder, is that supposed to be encouraging? Um, traveling a little bit around, I have found that what people need today, post-pandemic, is really encouragement. Um, I have uh, people in this service, I usually don't do this, they're going to kill me for this, but I want to encar- uh, recognize this morning, uh, my wife... Dorothy and my daughter right here with a friend. Dorothy, would you stand up? I know you're going to give me no bed and breakfast today, but that's Dorothy. Uh, And then uh, I have a friend who has been an encouragement to me. Uh, As you know, I just come back from Pakistan. In fact, I stood on the foundations of the house of Osama bin Laden and prayed uh, for the situation there among the uh, difficult uh, situation in Pakistan. And sitting at the back is my friend Elias. Elias, would you stand? And right there, Pakistani Christian. And uh, I, I, I'm, I, I've put together some PowerPoints and uh, want to encourage us this morning. But really, I want to share with you my heart. And the reason why I asked uh, these two sets of people, including my daughter here, Karis, uh, because these 
have been sources of encouragement to me. Um, a lot of time I stand like this on a stage and uh, do my stuff. I teach at Liberty University, have large classes, and they, you know, they see me in front. But what they really need to see is people like Elias who set things up, do things at the back, or so many of, of our mums. Uh, if, if you are a mother, a housewife, would you raise, if you're, if you're a mum, would you raise your hand up? Yeah. Some of you are not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, you know, there are many among us who are unnoticed and unappreciated. But I tell you, this message came to me because I tend to need an ego massage now and then. And this message of a character study that we'll be doing this morning is something that I found so desperately needed in Christian ministry today. And here at Reston, if you're here for our morning service, I did the first service, I want you to know that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I hope we'll be known as a church of caring people who encourage one another. The other reason I put these slides up is uh, to say to gratitude in missions to two people who invested in me. I've called this message, Be a Barnabas or Wanted Barnabases. And I'll tell you right up front what we're going to do. I'm going to challenge you to be a Barnabas. God is looking for Barnabases today. And uh, you may see that I will unpack certain aspects of his character that may be latent to many of us as we go through, you know, brush through scriptures, we have this swashbuckling tour, and we just skip over incidences, nuggets of gold that are somewhere embedded that we need to excavate, dig out. And I hope to do some of that today while we look into God's word. Uh, this man, uh, Wendell Calder, whom I went to see last month, uh, is aged, he's, he's still on fire, he, he had, he's the reason why uh, I came to America. I'll tell you why. Uh, in 1984, when missionaries were kicked out of India, he went to school with one of the missionaries who mentored, well, we didn't say mentored, though, discipled me. And uh, when Jack Wurtson from Word of Life, and if you heard of Word of Life Bible Institute, Jack, oh my goodness, yeah. Jack uh, wanted to send people to India, and there was no way you could come to India as a missionary. Wendell Calder, who was on the boat, said to Jack, Jack, why don't we bring some young fellows put the Bible under their belt, put the fire of God in their hand, send them out to reach people. 1984, I was the young man that Jack Wurtson and Wendell Calder brought to study at Word of Life Bible Institute. Um, today, he's retired, I mean, from Word of Life Bible Institute, his wife has dementia, so I went to spend some time just to encourage them while they can still recognize me. We're losing a whole generation of people who invested in us. Now it's our turn. The other person I thought of is Uncle John. Some of you may know. Any of you heard of John Stott? Yeah, John Stott mentored me. He was the one who encouraged me, gave me the, what you call the Langham Scholarship when I was in India. Uh, the Queen actually paid for my PhD. I love the Queen. So, you know, um, it was such a joy. But, you know, people who invest in us, uh, we are often in the receiving end. I think it's time we turn around and be part of the giving end. Giving particularly of ourselves. Yeah, we can give our substance. Some give their services. But first, we need to give ourselves. To kind of epitomize uh, or give us a model for this kind of a minister in our church, I want to look at Barnabas. But first, I want to define missions and how there's a seismic shift, if you may, in the way we do missions. Now, let me tell you up front, full disclosure, the gospel, the core of the gospel should never change. The message is one. The gospel is Jesus died, was buried, resurrected. He's the only savior who forgives sins, right? The only hope we have for heaven. However, there are things that are changing today in terms of the method, how we do, go about sharing that message. While the message is intrinsically one and should always be non-negotiable. The method, how we communicate that, needs to be radically different, especially post-pandemic. I mean, think about it, what we've gone through. I mean, now we sit in church comfortably, but two and a half, three years ago, we were petrified. 
because embedded in the word pandemic is the word panic. And we were all panicking. I mean, I don't know, she's sitting here. My wife and daughter came with two cars to pick me up at the airport. I was from Bhutan, landing in. Can you believe she gave me the, what do you call this, elbow? She put me in one of the cars. She says, go to your man cave in Liberty. Because I took the last flight. Only Emirates could fly, and I could kind of fought my way. And, you know, I was so desperate to get on that fight. I was like the third monkey getting onto the ark. And it, and it begins to rain. That was me, the third monkey getting on the ark and it's beginning to rain. I was like, I've got to get on this flight. Just came there, and then I went. I, I really felt so embarrassed because I went there. I was vomiting all night. There was no testing, by the way, at that time, so we were really scared. People were dying. They were fighting for toilet paper. I know, little fight. Of, and, and someone asked me, where are you coming from? I said, Nepal. I said, he said, do they have this problem? I said, we don't use toilet paper. I mean, yeah, I mean with some of the things we have a problem here is something that is so inconsequential. So anyway, I, I come back, and uh, Heritage Baptist Church there sent me someone with food. I really knew how a dog felt. I mean, seriously. They would leave my food by the door and go away. And I had to open the door and find my food. I was like, whoa, it's a real dog's life now, you know? Uh, we were so desperate, but church, listen to me. Before I go into this message, we have so much to be grateful for. Godliness that we'll find in Barnabas was a byproduct of the gratitude, the gratitude he had for the grace of God. And that was unique about Barnabas. He had this uncanny way to discern the grace of God at work. We need leaders in churches like that who can see the grace of God at work in people and other people and invest in that. So in this message, I'm going to show you that things are going to be shifting in missions. We, I hope we've learned something from the pandemic. You know, we, we go through these crises, 9-11, you know, never again, uh, you know, we, we, the axis of evil. And what happens? We get used to it. We go back. Life goes on, right? And that can happen to us. You remember how a small virus came and brought the entire world into a screeching halt. Everything sh shut down, right? There was a medical crisis. To go to work or not go. To live or to die. Eat or not eat. And we had all these divisions in our churches. I am exasperated trying to read and communicate some of the issues we've gone through. I don't even want to start in this church talking about it. I mean, there was... We started with a medical crisis. It ended up with a political crisis, with the change of guard there and the control of the government. Then we had what they call a cultural crisis. You remember that? Black Lives Matter, work churches with white supremacy, I think Brown Lives Matter, whatever. We're just fighting with each other. And then in my circles, we dealt with what they call the critical race theory and intersectionality with cancel culture, Me Too movements. Do you know, have you heard of these terms? If you haven't heard these terms, you are most blessed. <laughs> Just forget it. Really, the things we divide ourselves over are so inconsequential to the heart of the gospel, to see people come to know Jesus and to follow him. There's one man, my favorite character in the New Testament, that I didn't have a problem throwing these PowerPoints together. My problem was asking introspectively, Chris, is that you? And how far I am from this model of ministry. And I prayed a prayer, a simple prayer, that I want to be more worried about others than myself. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others, so let me ever be. Help me live for others that I might live for thee. I want to look at this character because when we come to missions, what is critical today is to have this ability to detect, to discern what God the Holy Spirit is doing. I'm so glad, I told Bruce, and I'm so glad that you're going through this whole thing with the, with the Holy Spirit. I think there's these two extremes. Some, uh, as uh, Chan would say, has got this forgotten God. You know, we don't even know that there's a God called the Holy Spirit, third person in the Trinity. We think it's Father, you know, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Gucci, whatever. And we're like, whoa, this is it. 
or everything we see is demonized and spiritual and we are not even practical in life. You met people like that? So spiritual minded they know of earthly use. Barnabas actually brings those two things, that combo together in such a potent way. It's worth reflecting on how to develop compassion, the art of compassion. And I must confess it is an art and a craft that is part of what we need to do by way of acquired learning. It just, we don't become compassionate overnight or say, Lord, I, I want to think of others and show solidarity in their suffering. That doesn't happen. We have to cultivate a nature that is not natural. That has to do with dying with self. And so when it comes to missions, uh, Reston, uh, I used to work with uh, OTAN, Outreach to Asian Nationals, as the executive director. And this church heavily invests in many of our missionaries. Some of you know my, my tremendous from here, went to Vietnam. She passed away. Reston supports many nationals doing church planting movements. Thank you for doing that. But here is my honest concern for us in America. We've gravitated to our comfort zones. And we think doing missions means writing out a check to somebody to go get the job done. And we put their pictures and like, we're a missionary church. Well, let me say, I'm so thankful you do that for us. But the gospel should never be outsourced. We've outsourced everything. You can't do that to the gospel. The gospel belongs to us, to everyone. Jesus' great commission, I call it the grave omission, is for everyone to expedite where we are. You say, well, uh, God's not called me to go to Pakistan. All right, listen. God may not call you to go overseas. Now watch what's happening. The phenomenon of missions is so radically changed. We are not going to the nations. But look at Reston. The nations are coming to us in our neighborhood. Is that right, Sujay? I mean, we have communities. Our church has Spanish, has Nepali, has Indian, have uh, people from all over the world converging to this place. We need Barnabases. Barnabases who may not cross the seven seas, but you may have to cross the street to, meet, to reach out to someone who's not like you, who doesn't believe what we believe. So missions I want to submit to us is very simply crossing those boundaries, but penetrating through barriers of prejudice or whatever it is, because missions is not just geopolitical. It's ethno-linguistic. It's people who don't speak our language, our heart language. Uh, What's your heart language? Let me do a test right here like I would do in our class. How many of you dream, have dreams in another language apart from English? Raise your hand. Look around. One, two, three, four. I can literally count the people groups in this church. When Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, pantata ethne, he did not mean geopolitical nation. There was no America or Canada, okay? He spoke about people with heart languages, with linguistic, cultural groups that are so different, the name of Jesus is not known to this nation. And there's no other name. So what I'm saying is we need Barnabases because these nations are now coming to us. What does that look like for rest in Bible church? I'm just asking you, what does it do that? We need missions right here. In fact, should I say, it starts in the laboratory of faith, the home. Penetrating barriers eventually to become a bridge. I see Barnabas, and I'll show you, as a bridge. uh, Between the text and the context. That's what a bridge is, isn't it? It's something that links two ends. There are people like you and I who know the text, which is the Bible. Rest in Bible church. We come here. We are like inductive Bible study, deductive Bible study. Now it's come to reductive Bible study. We are like really into that. And fine, we need that. I, I teach biblical theology. But there's a living context where people live. And we need Barnabases to make the gospel applicable and relevant to these people. Do you all understand what I'm saying? We really need Barnabases. So I hope as a result of this message that you and I will determine in this church Wherever God has planted you to be a Barnabas. Now, what does that mean? What does that entail? Let me begin by telling you a few things about Barnabas, but first reading scripture. Would you turn in your Bibles? Do you bring Bibles to churches these days or it all comes up on the board? You bring Bibles? Let me say this about my Bible. We've traveled together, my Bible and I, through all kinds of weather, storm clouds or blue skies. 
through sorrow or sunshine, tempest or calm, it's friendship unchanging, my lamp and my song. So who shall now part as my Bible and I? Shall isms or schism of new light which try? Shall shadow for substance or stone for good bread supplant its fine doctrines and give folly instead? Ah no, my dear Bible, exponent of light, thou sword of the spirit put error through flight and all through life's journey until my last sigh we'll travel together, my Bible and I. We need to travel together the word of God. One of the main things we see about Barnabas is that he was a man of the word. He was full of the word and full of the spirit. That is a deadly combo for being a missionary. Now let me see what's happening in this incipient, the early church, in the rudimentary stages of what it means to follow Jesus. There is a community for us to emulate. Look at that. Acts chapter 4 verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 30. Now, the full member, number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, unity. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Pause. This is not communism or the kind of socialism that's happening in America. This is a generosity. No one forced them. To do that, there was no common bag that they went and the government decided to give everybody some kind of a check. No, that was not what happening. What we see happening here is generosity. See how it's illustrated. Verse 33, and with great power. Did you see that? Great power. Why not? The Holy Spirit is at work. There is power. The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there was, you know what else? Great grace. Did you get those two great things? When you have the power of God at work, you will find the grace of God, great grace sufficient for our every need. For there was not a needy person in verse 34 among them, for many as were owners of land or houses, they sold those land and they brought the proceeds of what they sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as they had need. What a wonderful phenomenon, right? Now you have a case study. Now you have someone who epitomizes, someone who says, well, this is what it looks like. Well, who is that? So, therefore, thus, his name is not even Barnabas, for heaven's sake. The guy's name is what? Joseph. And he was nicknamed. The apostles called him what? Barnabas, and Luke puts in parenthesis that this means son of encouragement. Now, let me say something about the Aramaic and the Hebrew. Whenever you see the prefix ba, it means son of. So, Timaeus had a son. His name was? Oh, church, come on. You answer quickly, we finish early. It's very simple. <laughs> All right, listen to this. The word ba, the prefix ba means son of. So, a guy has a son. And the guy's name is Timaeus. His, name, his son's name is? You want to go out. All right. Bar Timaeus. <laughs> Nabis means encouragement, comfort, to strengthen others. So if Nabis means encourage, Bar Nabas means son of encouragement. All right. So that's how we get it. It's a nickname. It's not even the guy's name. Now listen to something else about this chap. So here he is. His name is Barnabas which means son of Enkra, he was a Levite. A Levite? You remember the 12th rites? Levite. And uh, he was a native of Cyprus. Now, this is not even Cyprus. That's Gentile territory. What's a Levite doing there anyway? Never mind, we'll find out. What did he do? He sold that field, the piece of land that belonged to him. He brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, a few things about this. First and foremost, I want to see that if we are going to be encouragers, we need to be large-hearted people, magnanimous, large-hearted. It starts there, in the heart. Yes, we, we have a lot of intention in the head. I want to do that. I wish I could help. But if you have a heart, any head will do, even a cabbage. You know, you need a heart. And this guy in his heart was basically an encourager, thinking about others. And everything he did was very interesting. The apostles watched him. 
He'd go there and he'd say, hey, hey, good to see you in church today. Hey, you changed your hair? I like your hair. It's really pretty today. He'd say, hey, how's your mom's doing? I heard she's a hospital. Huh? And I, today I found out Rachel's mom passed away to the, to, from the youth group. I know the two sisters pretty well when I come here. This broke my heart. I actually said, so how's mom doing? I know she was going through a tough time. And she, she passed away. I was like, oh my goodness, I should have known that. I should have been careful. Uh, some, I've met people like that in our churches. They're always concerned about you. Hey, did you get that job? How's that situation? Is it still toxic in your office? He was constantly helping. He says, listen, can I come over and pray? I heard your mom's not too well at all. And you're like, you're not a pastor. He said, it doesn't matter. And by the way, Barnabas would be called an apostle in scripture. But he's like, he doesn't care what title he has. He's not even worried what position you gave him. He's just getting the job done. He's an encourager. And the apostles watched this guy and they nicknamed him. They saw him and said, you son of encouragement. <laughs> what were you thinking? Okay, so you son of encouragement. That's, and the name stuck. The nickname stuck. The guy was an encourager. Barney, Barney, Barney. I would to God that people give us nicknames that demonstrate our true nature, our character. You see, because namos, nature, and natura, our name and nature should go together. Some people don't live up to their name because their nature is so different. Barnabas, by nature, was an encourager. He cared for people. He, he comforted them. He counseled them. And he made a difference in the church. Let me ask you. Do you have a Barnabas? Is that, do, you have, do you have someone like that in our church? We're going to look at a lot of stuff about this guy, but let me ask you, when you go through a crisis, is there someone you can pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, um, I, I just thought I'll share this with you. Would you pray for me? Is, is there someone in your church you, you're going through and you're like, I really don't know how to handle this. I can't talk to anyone else, uh, but can I come over and have some coffee? He's like, don't worry, I'll come over and have some coffee with you. Have you do you have people like that in our church? I mean, you, 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 you fail and you're like miserable and you're thinking, this is it, I don't know, can't see light at the end of the tunnel. Is there someone who comes to you and say, hey, I heard what happened to you. I just want to come and listen. Hey, tell, tell me about it. Is there someone you can say, you know, my spouse and I are going through a difficult time. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem our marriage is going to last. Uh, my kids are on drugs and I've not been the great father that I should have been. Uh, I don't know what to do. And they come alongside and journey with you. I mean, you need a Barnabas, right? We all need a Barnabas. You know why we all need a Barnabas? Because everybody is hurting in some way. If you have a ministry of encouragement, you will never lack a job. Because everyone around you is hurting. In some way. And this is the great upfront in where we can do mission and ministry because nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And let me say this, it starts at home. It starts with our spouses, with our children. This guy Barnabas is an amazing character. I always wanted to be like the Apostle Paul, but I'll tell you why. There was a shift in my mind because of Barnabas. There was a time... We went church planting, and there were times when we had a difficult time church planting, a lot of politics inside the church. Sometimes it was worse than the persecution I faced outside the church. You know, the church is like Noah's Ark. You know that. You can't stand the stink on the inside. <laughs> but you'd rather be in than out. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes there's a lot of issues, conflict resolution within the church. And people are giving up on churches. I'm coming from places after the pandemic. Uh, the, the, the paper I presented in Indonesia is on bivocational, bicultural, and now bicerebral, high-tech, low-touch uh, syndrome. You know, we, we, people are giving up. They're sick and tired. They're exasperated. And churches are being divided over all these issues I mentioned earlier. Rest in, we need to work together. We need unity in this. We need Barnabas. He said, like, okay, hold on, what, what, what's so great about this guy? Well, there came a time in my ministry that mentoring or reproducing myself and others made a big difference. That ambition to be 
a great pastor, city plant, you know, radio host, all that stuff shifted because God asked me a question. Chris, do you want to be big and great and do something? One, yeah, that's me. I want to do something big and great for God. Or do you want to equip and empower others who will do things bigger and better than you can do in your lifetime? Let me repeat that. Do you want to do something big for God? Or do you want to invest in others who will do things bigger and better than you could do within your lifetime? When I settle for the latter, I've had such a peace in ministry. That non-competitiveness has really released me to a kind of ministry that no longer, especially in Asia, where people are so jealous of one another coming up. I, it is so liberating to let go and let God use you. We need Barnabases. Well, you see, you still haven't illustrated it. Let me tell you, one guy who was Barnabas for me is Vic Stanley. His father pastors a church in Woodbridge. You can see the guy, Afro-American guy, tall. Uh, Vic uh, is from Chicago. He was actually a drug dealer and stuff like that. God cleaned him up so well, turned his life. He came to Liberty University. And he sat in my apologetics class. And he started arguing. And he, I mean, the furthest thing for him was missions. And God changed Vic's heart and mind. And he said, listen, I, I want to be a missionary. I said, okay. He said, where are you going? I want to join you. I said, I'm going to Nepal at that time. He said, I want to come to Nepal. He said, uh, do I need a passport? <laughs> I said, my is the Pope Catholic? I mean, seriously? <laughs> you want to know if you need a, pa you need a passport? He said, well, I, I, uh, juvenile detention, I, you know, I don't know if I can get a passport. Then we did a small Bible study on faith. The guy comes and says, I believe God, I'm going to get a passport. So I said, Vic, you realize three weeks we're going. <laughs> we, you, you can't get a passport. He says, you know, I went to the post office and I already submitted it. I said, post office? He says, yeah, we can do that. So I said, oh, fine. Okay, here's a guy, filled up his form. Three or four days before we leave to Nepal, he's got his passport. <laughs> he comes to Nepal, and you can see there, he's standing there, not ashamed to be a Christian. I said, Nick, there's, there's a lot of things happening in Nepal at this time. We've got to be very careful how we do ministry. He says, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I said, you are not, but the nationals, we need to protect them. That, you're leaving. They have to live here. He came there and he worked with our team of Nepalese. You can see them there. The guy second to your right is Prakash, one of our leaders. He's kind of my point person, the man of peace we first met. We saw something interesting that week. Because they could not publicly baptize, they usually like to go to a river or lake and baptize. There was problems. So they had these barrels uh, and they brought these in and uh, they filled it with water and they baptized them in these, in these. Nick was so moved. Vic said to me, you know, I want to make a difference. He worked with Prakash and he built a studio. Prakash, by the way, is an amazing composer of songs. Today, if you're in Nepal, you can hear Prakash Basel's songs on television. Uh, they are value-based, but he's, an, uh, he's a Christian. Vic, who did the audio for the White House, by the way, went and built that studio. Brought all the stuff, the latest equipment from the US for Prakash. We have a studio in his home because of Vic. Vic did something more. He found out that where Nepalese were growing these coffee beans, so he brought the coffee beans and he started, he opened up, he's a business guy, he opened up two restaurants in Lynchburg. If you're in Lynchburg and you go to White Heart, it's owned by Vic. Everything that proceeds in that fair trade goes to the farmers in Nepal. Now tell me, is he a missionary? Now you say, well, what's that got to do with Barnabas? Everything. Let me give you a few things on this first point of being magnanimous. First of all, he's a Levite, right? Do Levites own land? No. no. What's he doing with land? Secondly, Levite should be in the temple. This guy is in Cyprus, in a pagan area. What is he doing among the Gentiles? You know what I suddenly realized studying the book of Acts? There's a a radical shift in the way missions is happening. After the cross, 
the veil is rent. And we have become, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, we are a holy nation, we are a royal priesthood. Each of us are priests. We don't need a temple in Jerusalem. Because you will find out, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16, chapter 6 and verse 19, our bodies, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you see what happened? There's something changed. Rest and listen to this. We need to change. The only constant today is change. We need to find new ways of being missionaries across the street. We need to find out ways in which we can carry the gospel to the last, the lost, the least in our neighborhoods. Start with our family. And I want to submit to you a new operator's modorandi. The way to do it is through care and compassion. Being an encourager wherever you are. I mean, one of my students at Liberty was Miss America runner-up. Now, can you see me on the catwalk? <laughs> Don't have to laugh that loud, I mean, please. I mean, no. But someone I can pour into can go to places where I will never go, can be a witness. You see what I'm saying? I think we need more Barnabases in our churches not to pay a pastor to get the job done but being ministers of the gospel. I think Barnabas is a great example on several counts. Let me just list the turning point in the entire account. Luke is a historian. He's basically making a record of how the early church unfolded its global mission, okay? What's he doing? In Acts chapter 8 is Luke's most pivotal point, turning point. It's called the conversion of the apostle... Paul, many people don't realize how important that it, this event is. It certainly is for Luke because he records it three times. Three times he wastes ink, as we may think, on the conversion of Paul and giving a testimony of how he got the Damascus Road experience. Why would he do that? Because Saul was a unique person. This is why we don't have any theology on Barnabas, but everybody in cemetery, sorry, seminary, want to do <laughs> Pauline theology. Everybody's like into Paul. Why not? Paul is the greatest missionary church planter who literally wrote half of the corpus we call the New Testament, right? 13 of the books in the New 27 were written personally by the Apostle Paul. Besides that, he was the most brilliant mind of his time chosen by God very critically to do a task which is going to be absolutely significant for global missions. You say, what is that? Well, notice he's from Tarsus, but he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Right, Philippians 2. What, what is this about Paul? He knew the law, the Torah. For heaven's sake, he's educated under Gamaliel. The Gamaliel. He knew the law. He was a PhD. My daughter calls a PhD a permanent head damage. But anyway, I mean, this, this guy was, a, he knew that. He knew that he could argue a case for monotheism. But also, he was a Greek philosopher in his own right. Acts chapter 17, he could go up to Areopagus, the Mars Hill, and he could argue with the only two philosophers mentioned in the entire scripture the Stoics and the Epicureans, and he could preach the resurrection and present the gospel at that level. Not many can do that. He could take the unknown God and say, here is Christ, Jesus, Anastasia, and the resurrection. Wow. But he was also a Roman citizen. He had the passport to the world. Under Pax Romana, he could travel anywhere. And though he didn't use it for his own advantage, Paul at times could kind of take his little toga off and show his little, and say, hey, I'm a Roman. And the guy's like, whoa. So you can see the Roman tributary, the Greek philosophy, and the Hebrew monastery was all in one mind. Brilliant. But you know what the problem was? He was educated beyond his intelligence. You met people like that? This guy could win an argument, but at the end he loses the person. You know someone like that who wins the argument, you lose the person. This guy was so obnoxious and so self-consumed that God could not use him. In fact, five times 
he says he was beaten up by rods, implying what? He's been to a synagogue, and they literally beat the guy up. I mean, this sounds funny. There came a time in the church, they put Saul in a basket at night, lowered the guy and said, get out of town. Go to task, just get away. I mean, he was literally a basket case. <laughs> Read your Bible. I mean, this is interesting. God could not use him because of this. He had all the gifts of the Spirit. He could quote and write 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. But what did he lack? 1 Corinthians 13. He lacked love. He lacked that compassion. Church, I know you're going to do a series on the, on the Holy Spirit. Let me say this. The gifts of the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, will only divide the church. The fruit of the Spirit is what, church? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness, self-control. Some of us leaders lack the fruit. That's why we become nuts with the gifts. We must remember... Anyone from California? Okay. Are we, we not, just kidding. So it's so important for us to remember. Now, I told you we've been to the place where Ben Laden was. Uh, you know, these situations. Suppose, case in point, Let's take Saddam Hussein. You remember Saddam Hussein? Okay. He gets converted. This is just a case in point. He gets converted. He comes to rest in Bible church. He says, Pastor Jim, sir, um, and, and he says, Bruce, I'd like to be a member of rest in Bible church. Could you give me the right hand of fellowship? I tell you, they will have an elders meeting. They say, listen, let's go slow on this case. Let's find out his track record. You know, everybody in the church in Jerusalem said, oh my goodness, this guy's a murderer. He's been killing people, women and children, dragging them. He can't be a member or not. Everybody said, no, 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 Saul, no, except one person. Who was that? Barnabas. He said, I'll vouch for him. I'll vouch for him. I have observed this guy. He preaches the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus has said he's going to suffer a lot before you can use it. You see, suffering has a way of being pedagogical, can teach us, can train us. And it is through suffering that he's going to learn how to promote the gospel. Now, who is Barnabas? How is he magnanimous? The reason why I put up those two pictures of Wendell Calder and John Stott is because they looked at me from South India, who had nothing. My mother borrowed money, pawned her gold necklace, wedding necklace, to put me in a school so I can learn English. Somebody invested in me. A Barnabas doesn't look at someone for who they are. They invest in them for what they can become by the grace of God. Shall I say that again? A Barnabas doesn't look at people the way you look at your tattoos. I mean, you never, I mean, the language, I mean, for, oh man, that person. They look at them for what they can become. Are you a Barnabas? Start in your own family. Are you a Barnabas? Start in your own workplace. Rest in Bible church needs Barnabases. If we get people like Saul's, I mean, I've been with Bruce and others through your change in God from Mike Minter now to Jim Sup. I tell you, if we just look at leaders for their competence and not for their character, the fact that Jesus can shape them like we prayed to his image, then we've lost the plot. We need Barnabases who will identify breakthrough barriers of prejudice and, and, and look away from the past to what is in the future. Who are these two guys? Anyone? You, you recognize this? I'm coming back from Nepal, so this is a hint. Sorry? That's right. Sir Edmund Hillary, who's known to be the first explorer to conquer Mount Everest, and with him is the Gurkha, the Sherpa, Tenzing Norge. Okay? Now, I've worked among these people. Did you know, as of date, there is no record of Edmund, or Sir Edmund, he, he was knighted later, Sir Edmund to have been on Mount Everest? 
It's a funny incident because the Gurkha, the Nepali jungly guy, couldn't use the camera. You know those days they had these long cameras, you look, you look down and you take a picture. This guy couldn't figure it out. So what Sir Edmund did, he took the picture and asked the Nepali guy to hold the Union Jack, you know, the, the, the flag of Britain, the Union Jack and smile. So the picture and proof of the first one who conquered Mount Everest is the Gurkha, is Tenzing Norgay. But the one who led the exposition was actually in the background taking the picture. That's so different from our selfie generation, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, think about it. I I'm talking to myself now. I mean, it, we always want to be in the picture. Barnabas did not. Barnabas wanted to put Saul. Now, people who do that have problems. And I want to look at the second part of this Barnabas. But let me say a few things about Nepal before I go. I love Mount Everest. And every time I went, even recently, I took my brother. That's from an aeroplane. Uh, and from Buddha Air, you can take a picture of the top of the world looking down on civilization. You're like, you know. But then when you look in the, in the lower regimes, you see people living there in the foothills of the Annapurna range. You're like, and I, honestly, I see, even today I can see it. I looked down and I saw, and I said to my friend, who are these people? These unreached people. I mean, how did they get? Did they fall from heaven? Or, I mean, how did they get there? You know what? The next thing that gripped my heart has the gospel gone to those people. Do they know about Jesus? So I asked them, who are these people? Well, they said, these are the tribal people. They gave me their profile and all that stuff. I said, has the gospel gone there? He said, not really. I said, how do they survive? Well, they have mountain goats and they grow these things. You know, they, I said, okay. So I came back to the camp and we had our training. I still remember that year. And I said to them, I'll come here, but I won't come here next year or whenever if you don't bring the next younger generation. Churches in America, we are losing a whole generation of young people because the gospel is not relevant to them. And I said, I challenged these young men and women. I said, listen, I went there and I saw this happening. Do you know anyone? And they all said, no, we looked at this. We got beaten up. We're not going there again and all that. So I went to the training and eventually one young man, Anil, said to me, and Dr. G, aap mujhe train kijiye, mai jaunga. You train me, I will go. I'm a Gurkha. I belong to that tribe. And today as I speak, Anil is now right there. I mean, I get tired looking at that place. He is climbing those mountains and establishing churches among his own people. You see what the, the Barnabas effect can have? It can really strengthen others, draw the potential out of them. At what price is the next question? Now, if you turn in your Bible, so let me just read this. Acts chapter 13. They come to an island called Paphos. And if you read verse 6 and 7, something very interesting is happening. Uh, follow me, because here is Paul. Oh, sorry, sorry, not Paul. Barnabas and Saul. You say, well, how did they become part of the team? Well, they heard in chapter 11 that there are some people in Antioch. You know Antioch? I mean, maybe we don't know Antioch at this time. But after Rome and Alexander, Alexandria, Antioch was the hub for civilization. Do you understand? The church at Antioch. But how did it start? Well, there were people in Antioch they were preaching the gospel, the church was growing, and so the headquarters in Jerusalem said, who are those people? How come they're preaching? They were not at Pentecost in Jerusalem. Who gave them permission to do that? Have you met people like that? You don't look at the person next to you, but some people, <laughs> they always want to be in command and control. Have you met people like that? They didn't ask me. And if you don't clear it through them, they really will make it difficult for you. Have you met people like that? I have met, I'm talking about church leaders, not this church, but other church, leaders who are so toxic in their environment because they want to control others, not Barnabas. So now the Jerusalem church says, who gave them permission? Who's, what's going on in that pagan Antioch? There's some Christians. And by the way, chapter 11, verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians where? In Antioch. So they're like, 
Who are these little Christs? Church, tell me. Who do they send to check it out? Who do you think they would send? Go and check it out. See, find out what's going on. They would send, oh, come on, they would send Barnabas. Have you ever wondered why they chose Barnabas? Well, just culturally speaking, he's lived in a context that was Gentile, so he understands the people group. Secondly, he must know the language, has a heart for them. He worked there, he sold his land, remember that? So he understands the business as mission. Is that why they chose him? They chose him for one reason. He found evidences of the grace of God. He could see God's grace at work. You know, there's not many people like that who can look at young people or people with issues or addiction and say, you know what? By the grace of God, they can be better. They send Barnabas. So Barnabas is going, right? He stops. He says, hey, listen. He suddenly remembers. There was this guy who came to the church and he said he had a vision of Jesus. And Jesus said, I have chosen you to go to the Gentiles, the nations. Who is that? Saul. So you know what Barnabas does? He goes to the Taurus Mountains and there hunkered down is this guy Saul who's beaten up five times. He's like, no way. And he's like, Saul! Saul? Hey, Saul, we need you. He's like, is that Barney? He said, yeah. He said, last time you introduced me, I got into trouble. This is extraction too. I don't want to go and rescue anybody. Forget it. He's like, listen, we need you because God is doing something among the Gentiles. And I believe you're part of that. Church, listen to me. He picks this guy up from the mountains, beaten up, given up on missions, and he brings them. And he starts in chapter 15, what we call the missionary journeys. Did you know that? He goes to a place called Galatia. Now, you may not know much about the Gauls, but you don't want to be a missionary in Galatia. Did you know that one third of the Roman Empire were enslaved? They made them slaves. That's how Rome's controlled the world. Pax Romana. We bring priests because we rule, you work. But when they came to Galatia, are you ready for this? Nine out of ten of the Galatians were enslaved. They made them slaves because they were so uncouth, unruly, untrustable, vicious people. Now, do you want to be a missionary? Now, as they went to that journey, there was a young man. His name was John Mark. You know the story. And for some reason, we don't know why, he says, I don't know. I want to go back home. But before that, something very interesting happens. Now, hold on. They come to an island called Paphos, a Gentile island. Who's the governor in that island? Sergio Paulus, the Roman consul. With him is another sidekick. His name is Elimus. This guy's a sorcerer, uh, a witchcraft guy. He's dealing with evil spirits. And he's like consulting him and calling the spirits and evoking them. So here is Sergio Paulus and here is the demon-possessed sorcerer, Elimus. On this side is the leader, Barnabas. And with Barnabas is the new recruit, Saul. So he's watching this. And this magician is doing all this sorcery stuff. Saul steps up. Calls him, you son of the devil. This is in the Bible, by the way. Read it. You son of the devil. He rebukes Elimus. Are you ready? He smites him blind. That's very interesting. Jesus blinded Paul, and then he opened his eyes. Paul, by the Spirit, blinds and shows the power of God. Now, we may not understand this in the Western culture, but in many of the cultures I work, it is not just truth encounter. You know, who wins? God. It's like on Mount Carmel, there's power encounter. Which God is more powerful? And they'll choose that. If he healed them, they'll be... I mean, in most of the countries I go, you ask them, why do you follow Jesus? They'll tell you how their child got healed in some disease and how demons were... And that's why they follow Jesus. Very different in America. We want to sit and argue for the truth. And I'm glad you're doing uh, a, less, a whole series on the Holy Spirit. I, I am Bapticostal. I believe in the Bible and the Spirit working together. But it's very interesting. He sees this power encounter. 
and Sergio Paulus becomes a Christian. He says, what power is this? He doesn't get saved because of signs and wonders. He gets saved because faith comes by and hearing the... So Paul explains, and the guy becomes a Christian, right? You know who's watching all this phenomena? Barnabas. Barnabas does this something which is very interesting. He sees the Holy Spirit work with this young guy, Saul. He steps down from leadership. He not just steps down, he steps away and lets Saul lead. Acts chapter 13 and verse 9, Luke pens historically that from that point, Saul, who is now called you will never, ever read the name Saul again. He is now the apostle to the Gentiles. Now think about that. Think about what happened with a leader like Barnabas willing to step down and step away. You know why younger leaders don't emerge in churches? The older guys don't step away. I'm being honest with you. That includes me. We want to be in control. We need to trust people. You're like, they're going to fail. We failed. Somebody trusted us. We need to journey with them. Barnabas did. This is something sad because conflict does happen with leaders. After they report to Jerusalem, they decide to make the second missionary journey, this time into Asia. This guy, Saul, who is now Paul. It was Barnabas and Saul. Then it becomes Barnabas and Paul. From chapter 13, it becomes Paul and Barnabas. After they report, it's Barnabas gone. It's Paul and his team. So Paul picks up some other guys like Silas and Timothy and grooms them. But something happens. Listen to this. They have a division in this church between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. John Mark? What did he do? Well, Paul says, listen, that guy's a quitter. We were in Galatia, and the guy said, I'm going back to Jerusalem. Now, honestly, Luke doesn't tell us why John Mark left. I don't know. Was he sick? Terrible, couldn't go to that region. Was he really afraid? of the terrorism in that area. There are people like that. Or did he just miss his mom's fish and chips, go back to Jerusalem? I don't know. The point is, he went back. And the point is, Saul says, now Paul, I'm in charge. He's not coming. He gives up on John Mark, except who? Barnabas says, I'll take him. I'll take him. And he goes with John Mark to Cyprus, their hometown, and back to Jerusalem. I want to say something about people who are mediators, who stand in the gap, because we are looking about this in terms of missions. Let me just say this about people who are mediators. I want to summarize this with this point. You say, what a waste. We only know about the Apostle Paul and his three missionary journeys and the letters he wrote to Timothy. Timothy became the bishop of Ephesus and my goodness, Silas helped people write letters. Listen, history is always written from the perspective of the historian, the person who writes it. So Luke is writing to establish Paul's credentials as an apostle. That's why he's giving this to Theophilus, right? Now follow this. Who wrote about Barnabas? Who knows? Who cares? Here's my thesis for this morning. Humanly speaking, humanly speaking, there will not have been a Paul if it wasn't for a... Who wrote the first gospel in your Bible? Who who wrote the first gospel? Who? John Mark. Because this guy who was rejected as a quitter, because quitters don't win and winners don't quit, this guy went back to Jerusalem, he heard Peter's sermons, and he wrote the first gospel you got in your Bible called Mark. 
But tell me, we not only wouldn't have a Paul, you wouldn't have the first God, humanly speaking, without Barnabas. You see why we need Barnabases in churches? Deal Moody said this that has gripped my heart ever since. The world is yet to see what God can do with a person who doesn't care who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. Let me say that again. The world is yet to see what God can do with a person who doesn't care who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. That is Barnabas. We need more Barnabases. God had only one son and he sent him. Others. Jesus had only 12 disciples and only one wasn't a missionary. Who was that? Judas and he was a traitor. And I'm going to ask you today, I want to pray. We've looked at a character here who has really influenced me post-pandemic a lot. Because I'm a, like, a little bit like the Apostle Paul. I think I am. But what I really want, would you pray for me? What I really need to be as the director of training is someone who invests in others who will do things bigger and better than me after I'm gone. Because who cares who gets the credit? You'll never know how much your care can influence someone else where they are. So here are the three options are. Would you go? I'm not saying across the seas. Would you go across the street? Would you step out and say, Lord, I want to start with my own family. I want to look at my own neighborhood. I want to start where you've planted me in my place of work. I want to bloom for your glory. Would you say that, Lord? I will go. But before that, let me ask you, will you let go? That's our problem. We are selfish people. You like me? I like me too, you know? <laughs> we have movies called Despicable Me, part three. I mean, are you serious? How can we be Barnabases if it's all about me? I want to encourage you this morning. Would you say, Lord, I'm going to find a Barnabas because I need encouragement. But I want to press this a little more for rest. In. Would you commit with me and say, Lord, I want to be a Barnabas. I want to die to self. I want to encourage others. And I promise you, what goes around, comes around. God's going to bless you. Nobody's going to write about you. You still will be unnoticed, the unsung hero. But someone else keeps the record. I want to present to you, Barnabas. Would you go? If not, would you let go? And for heaven's sake, help people to keep on going till Jesus comes. Shall we pray? Bow our heads, close our eyes. Here's my closing prayer. Thank you for listening. And I want, I want you to know, I almost feel sad that I'm speaking here at Reston because you are generous. You are giving, you are serving. But maybe God's speaking to some of you today. And you're saying, you know what, Dr. you just pray for me. I really need a Barnabas at this time. I want to find a small group or whatever where I'm accountable, where I can draw some encouragement. I need advice. I need help. I need a Barnabas. Would you do that? Would you find someone to mentor? Who will mentor you? Who will spend some time with you? This year, many great leaders fell, including the president of my university, one of the great apologists, and the greatest Old Testament scholar. All of them fell morally, financially, all that. You know why? They did not have accountability. You can rise and be great and fall. Would you say, Lord, help me find a Barnabas? But here's the real invitation. Would you say, because of God's word, the Holy Spirit has asked me, mom, dad, kids, worker, God has asked me to intentionally be a Barnabas. I want to encourage others. If that's your desire with me, all over, would you lift your hand up and say, just pray for me. Lift your hand up, keep it up. I want to pray for you. God spoke and you say, you know what? I want to intentionally be a Barnabas or Mrs. Barnabas, whatever. Raise your hand up, hold it and say, Lord, I want to intentionally be an encourager. I want to invest in people to get the gospel out. Heavenly Father, thank you for all our hands. These are empty hands. We can't hold on to these things. You need to hold us, Holy Spirit. Would you do that this morning? Would you hold us and lead us in paths of righteousness? 
would you hold us and make us not just more like Barnabas, help us to be more like Jesus. Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. For his namesake, we pray. And God's people said, 